Welcome to the Bible Answer Man broadcast with your host, Hank Hanegraaff. The Bible Answer Man is the radio ministry of the Christian Research Institute, designed to equip believers to defend their faith and become true disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ because life and truth matter. Our phone number is 888-7000-CRI. You can find us on the internet at equip.org. The following program was pre-recorded. And now to begin today's broadcast, here's Hank Hanegraaff. And thank you very much, Randy. As always, it is such a privilege to be in studio. I never take it for granted. Every single day before I come into the studio, I spend time in prayer, thanking the Lord for those who have made this one-of-a-kind ministry a possibility around the world. Let's go right to the phone callers. First up is Dorothy listening in California. Hi, Dorothy. Hello. I had heard somewhere that the Holy Spirit and wisdom, spoken of in the book of Proverbs, are one and the same. And I wanted to get your take on it to see if there was any truth to it. Well, the truth of the matter is that the Holy Spirit inspired the words of Proverbs, and therefore they're useful for faith and practice. And this is what Paul tells Timothy. In Timothy 2, he says to young Timothy that all Scripture is God-breathed, it's useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the men of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. And so when you look at a book like Proverbs, you have the principles and maxims for living life in a way in which you can be successful, not in a hedonistic, worldly sense, but in a sense in which your success is directly tied to your relationship to the spirit that lives within. And there's so many wonderful Proverbs. Every enterprise becomes wise through planning, through common sense, through staying abreast of the facts, or there's no wisdom or counsel or understanding against the Lord. The horse is prepared for the day of battle, but victory belongs to the Lord. And you look at chapters like Proverbs chapter 3, which is one of my favorites. How blessed is the man who finds wisdom and the man who gains understanding, for its profit is better than the profit of silver and it's gained than fine gold. She's more precious than jewels, and nothing you desire compares with her. Or the Lord by wisdom founded the earth by understanding. He established the heavens by his knowledge. The deeps are broken up, and the skies drip with dew. The book of Proverbs is just rife with wisdom. It comes from the Holy Spirit. That's great. Okay, yeah, I love the book of Proverbs. I kind of take that track of, you know, reading one chapter a day, you know, for the every day of the month. That's and, fantastic. Uh, do my study, my devotional oh, based on that. That I is so it. fantastic. I mean, that's really one of the things, Dorothy, that I recommend that people do, which is to read one chapter of Proverbs every day, then you work yourself through the book once a month on average. And it's, you know, again, all the maxims, principles, for successful daily living encapsulated in the book of Proverbs. It's fantastic. I love it. And I thank you for taking your time and answering my question. I really appreciate that. Absolutely. My privilege, Dorothy. Thank you so much for calling. And I know that what you said will be an encouragement to many people listening in. Let's go back to the phone lines. Talk to Ron Prescott, Arizona, listening on the web. Hi, Ron. Good evening, uh, Hank. Good evening. I've heard stories from pastors on the radio of Muslims having dreams of Jesus speaking to them, and then they get saved after he appears to them in the dream. Have you heard of these stories, and do you think they're for real? Well, I have heard of the stories, and I think they certainly could be for real. Which is to say that oftentimes there's an evangelistic stretching of the truth element that circulates in Christian circles. And so you have these stories and then they're embellished and further embellished and so forth. But having said that, can they be true? Absolutely. The normative way that God reaches people is through human agency. But 
That is not to say that God cannot directly reach someone through a dream in which Jesus identifies himself, not in the Muslim way of a great prophet or even a sinless prophet, but in the sense that this is, in fact, the Lord of glory. And if this is a genuine revelation, they immediately have to give up Muhammad is a false prophet, because Jesus Christ communicates that he is in fact God. And according to Muhammad, it would be an unforgivable sin to consider Jesus Christ to be God. That is the sin of shirk in Islam. So yeah, I mean, if Jesus identifies himself, I am the one who spoke and the universe leapt into existence. I am the one who knit you together in your mother's womb. I'm the one who lived the perfect life that you could never live. That kind of direct revelation is certainly possible, but it would not be normative. It wouldn't be the norm. Do you think it's possible that some of these stories could be a situation where Satan has appeared to them or a fallen angel in a dream, uh, according to Second Corinthians eleven fourteen. Well, it could be, but remember, if the angel of enlightenment is a true angel of enlightenment, they're going to point you to the true Christ. If it is a false angel, then that angel, though it appears in glory, is going to take you away from the true Christ. And that's why we're called to test the spirits to see if they are from God. And someone that is genuinely seeking after light will receive light. Remember, this is the promise we have in Scripture. Paul, he points it out in Romans chapter 1, Romans chapter 2. We have the light of creation. We have the light of conscience. If we respond to the light that we have been given, then we will get further light. So that God puts us in the exact places and times so that we can reach out for him, as Paul said, and find him, though he's not far from each one of us. So if we're searching after light, we will receive light. If we're genuinely panting after God who has expressed himself in the cosmos and in our conscience, then we will get the light of Christ. That is the promise that we're given in Scripture. And back to the phone lines. Next up is Stuart listening in Kansas City, Kansas. Hi, Stuart. Hi, Hank. My question is, is obedience necessary to receive God's blessing? Well, I think so. You know, I think one of the things that's important to realize is what God himself tells us in his word, and that is that obedience is actually better than sacrifice. God does not delight in sacrifice. He doesn't take pleasure in burnt offerings. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. So you look at a person like David. He was blessed materially. He was blessed in every single way. And Yet he sinned in great ways, but God continued to bless him. Why? Because his heart was a heart that longed after God. We have the inverse situation where we have people that followed Christ, and yet Jesus was saying to them that they were not genuine at all. They said, Lord, Lord, but they didn't really love him. They loved what was on the master's table but they didn't love the master. And so they might have material blessings, all of what comes by being close to Christ, but their hearts are far from him. And I think we have many people that are examples of that. They love being around the Lord because of what the Lord does for them. And you think about the early Christian church, it's a great example of what happens. You go back to the embryonic church, and people would be crucified. They'd be vilified. They'd be slaughtered by animals, torn apart, limb from limb. And yet they did it with joy because they knew that like their Savior, they would rise immortal, imperishable, incorruptible. So they counted the things of the world as nothing to them because they were looking at eternal treasure. We had the inverse happen as Christianity began to become popular in the Roman Empire. Once it became the state religion, well, now people started going to church because it was good for business. You could find a pretty wife in church or a reliable wife in church. You could have all these benefits by being in the community of faith. And so people started coming for all the wrong reasons. 
And what happened was a great apostasy, people turning away from the genuine faith to a counterfeit faith. So the real issue is the motive of the heart. And you see that with Cain and Abel as well, don't you? They both gave offerings, and both of the offerings, I mean, there are a lot of teachings in Christian circles, I was just reading about this the other day, where, where people will say that Cain's offering was not acceptable because of what the offering constituted. It was a grain offering as opposed to the offering of an actual animal. And so it was an unacceptable offering. But that's not the real issue. If you look deeply into the text, the real issue is a different issue. It was a disposition of the heart. Cain's heart did not long after God. Abel's heart did. And that's why Abel's sacrifice was accepted and Cain's was unacceptable. So the real issue here is the disposition. What is the disposition of your heart? We'll be right back with more. Gay Girl, Good God chronicles Jackie Hill Perry's journey out of a homosexual lifestyle, a much needed testimony for a time when society has embraced radical changes to traditional views of sexual identity. Jackie Hill Perry didn't write Gay Girl, Good God merely to point out the mistakes of her past, but to shine light on the beauty of a relationship with a good God while helping people understand the realities of same-sex attraction. To receive your copy of Gay Girl, Good God, call 888-7000-CRI and make a gift to support the Christian Research Institute's life-changing outreaches, 888-7000-CRI or visit us at equip.org. We'll be back in just a moment with more from Hank Hanegraaff. A deeper understanding of the Bible's principles and truths will improve the spiritual, moral, and ethical problems facing our nation. Yet the obstacle isn't that the Bible doesn't speak to our greatest needs or answer our deepest questions. It's that the average person lacks the time and tools to extract the answers. That's why Hank Hanegraaff wrote the complete Bible answer book, Collector's Edition, revised and updated. This expanded edition addresses over 210 of the top questions he's received as host of the Bible Answer Man broadcast. Hank has taken the complex and made it simple and memorable. Receive the revised and updated complete Bible answer book as our thank you for your gift by calling 888-7000-CRI and make a gift to support CRI's life-changing outreaches. 888-7000-CRI or visit equip.org that's equip.org. Bertrand Russell famously said, most people would rather die than think, and many of them do. Not so with CRI support team members. Support team members are not only serious thinkers, but their membership in CRI's support team helps to equip hundreds of thousands of fellow believers around the globe each and every month. Are you not a member? Then you're missing out. Not only do support team members form the backbone of Christian Research Institute's outreaches, but they enjoy their selection of resources from our Equipping Essentials Library and receive a complimentary subscription to CRI's award-winning Christian Research Journal, just two of the benefits of membership. To discover how you can make a difference 24-7 in equipping believers at home and abroad to stand for life and truth, check out the benefits of membership at equip.org. Jackie Hill Perry used to be a lesbian. In Gay Girl, Good God, she shares her story of embracing masculinity and homosexuality with every fiber of her being. She knew the Christian worldview on sexual identity, but how was she supposed to stop loving women when homosexuality felt more natural to her than heterosexuality ever could? Ultimately, Jackie came face to face with what it meant to be made new. God broke in and turned her heart toward Him right in her own bedroom through the light of His gospel. Read Gay Girl, Good God in order to understand. Read in order to hope or read in order, like Jackie, to be made new. To receive your copy of Gay Girl, Good God, call 888-7000-CRI and make a gift to support the Christian Research Institute's life-changing outreaches, 888-7000-CRI, or visit us at equip.org. Now 
Now back to the Bible Answer Man broadcast and your host, Hank Hanegraaff. Back to the phone lines. Next up is Ashley listening in Georgia on the web. Hi, Ashley. Hey, Hank. How are you? I'm doing well. Thank you. Good, good. Um, my question is probably a popular question, but I was just wondering if there were, if you had any biblical um, verses to support it. But um, just a common question of why is it that God allows evil and suffering in the world? Um, and I know the I know an answer to that, but I was just wondering if there are scriptures um, to support that. Yeah, well, not only scriptures, but the grand meta narrative of scripture, the big story supports the reason why there is evil in the world. And, and, and the major reason there's evil in the world is because God created the potential for evil. Now note I didn't say that God created evil. I said that God created the potential for evil. Why? Because he created us as volitional beings. And without doing that, love would be rendered meaningless. So God creates us with the ability to act or act otherwise, and out of that comes the best of all possible worlds, a world in which we will forever be able not to sin. What's really important to recognize is that if you look at the philosophical, plausible answers to this question, there are only three. People think there may be hundreds, but there are only three. And when you have pantheism, which really denies the existence of, of evil, because in that worldview, all is God and God is all. You have philosophical naturalism, which again denies the existence of evil. This is the worldview undergirding evolutionism, which supposes that everything is just a function of random processes, and therefore there can be no such thing as good or evil. And then there's theism which has a relevant response. In fact, the only relevant response, and if you want the true response, it comes through Christian theism. So the idea here about evil is that God creates a world in which we are volitional beings, and therefore by our choices we actualized evil. Now we can get rid of evil. God could do that in the next millisecond, but that would mean getting rid of all of us because all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So what God has done is he's allowed the wheat and the tares to grow up together. And even those who are the wheat recognize that we are sinful, but we have now the grace of God's liberation through the person and work of Jesus Christ. Okay. Well, thank you so much, I really appreciate it. You got it, and I wrote about this in the Complete Bible Answer Book, Collector's Edition, revised and updated. Back to the phone lines. We'll talk to Basil, listening in Kentucky, Sirius XM 131. Hi, Basil. Yes, Hank. How are you doing? I'm well, thank you. Yes, I have a question. What must we do to be saved? Do we need to receive the Holy Ghost? Um, what, What do we need to do to be saved? Yeah, you have to have a desire in your heart to follow the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. You want to be a principal, a participant in the kingdom of Jesus Christ. That needs to be your principal goal, to be a follower of Jesus Christ. And so what does that mean? Well, it means that by God's grace, the Holy Spirit woos you and you respond to the wooing of the Holy Spirit. And when you do then you, by God's grace, place your trust in the only one who bridged the chasm between humanity's sinfulness and God's utter righteousness and holiness. And that is the person and work of Jesus Christ. You say, I'm going to be a follower of Jesus Christ and trust in him and what he did for my salvation, for my reconciliation to God, rather than trusting in what I can do. Okay. Sounds great. I appreciate you taking your time to answer my question. Sure. And Basil, what happens when you become a participant in the kingdom, you follow the King of Kings and his principles, right? So let's say you say, I want to follow Christ. Well, one of the things you do is you identify with Christ through his church. 
And so you become baptized within the context of a community of believers. And you take up your cross and you daily follow him. Okay. Thank you. You got it. Back to the phone lines. Marlene, listening in Missouri. Hi. Yes. Hello. How are you, sir? I'm well, thank you. Um, I have three questions, but if we don't get to all of them, that's fine. First, um, a while back, I caught a, just bits and pieces of one of your shows where I heard the word or the name Swagger in Cult. My mother and I watch him a lot. He emphasizes Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross, and uh, Paul in Romans does too. What is it about Jimmy Swagger that would uh, cause him to be uh, cultish? Yeah, probably what you heard was the fact that Jimmy Swagger will take religions and he will call them cults, and he'll do that in a gratuitous fashion rather than really understanding what a cult is from both a theological perspective or from a sociological perspective. But he himself, while he is castigating others, teaches a very bad doctrine. For example, he teaches that within the Godhead, there are three separate and distinct persons, each having his own personal spirit body, personal soul, and personal spirit. And he believes that God's body is in one place at one time, as though God has a body. Many other problems with his teachings theologically, but the biggest problem with Jimmy Swaggart is really a function of his moral failures, and I don't want to get into them because that's not my area of expertise, but I can tell you that he was defrocked by the Assemblies of God after refusing to submit to disciplinary action after his moral failures. And unfortunately, since he distanced himself from the authority of his former denomination, he started referring to it as a cult, alleging that some of its officials were in league with the pornographers. And this is simply a way of rejecting his own moral culpability and guilt. Yeah, there's times when he uh, speaks on uh, situations like that, but he never comes out and says, you know, like, I overcame it, and uh, it's uh, in the mid-'80s or whenever. It just, he says that... uh, God gave him the inspiration of uh, Jesus Christ and the cross and what he did there. And uh, Well, I can't judge him as a person. I, I'm not in a position to do that. That's the province of the Holy Spirit. I was simply pointing out that probably what you heard me say is what he has said that the Assemblies of God is a cult. He referred to it in that way. And he said that the Assemblies of God, his former denomination, was in league with pornographers. These were his words, and I was simply quoting his words. But I'm also pointing out that he has, apart from the moral failure, he has serious theological aberrations. And so if you're listening to him, you have to have real discernment so that you can discern between wheat and chaff and heat and light. You get a lot more heat than light in listening to him, and I'm sure you know that if you're a student of the Scriptures. Yes. Uh, Now, for the second, uh, I believe you do not believe in the rapture, but somewhere in Thessalonians and in uh, Revelation chapter 5, I think, it says that... uh, God will keep his church from the wrath to come. And Yeah, that's, that's actually, you're probably referring to Revelation chapter 3, but that text says nothing whatsoever about the second coming or the rapture, and it's impossible to suppose that Jesus is promising to protect the church in Philadelphia from something that's going to occur 2,000 years later. Again, that's a subject of the art and science of biblical interpretation. It's important to read passages like 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, rightly. This is a great and glorious passage on resurrection. It says nothing about a pre-tribulational rapture. 
Neither do we have anything said by our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ to the church in Philadelphia about a pre-tribulational rapture. That's imposing something on the biblical text that the text is not designed to teach us. So if you want to believe in a pre-tribulational rapture, you want to do that on the basis of sound hermeneutical principles. Again, I'm talking about the art and science of biblical interpretation. By the way, this is one of those issues we can debate vigorously. We ultimately don't have to divide over, but ideas do have consequences, so I think it's an enormously important issue. When I say it's secondary, I don't mean it's not important. Unfortunately, we're out of time for this edition of the Bible Instrument broadcast. Do remember Monday through Friday at this time, you can dial 888 Ask Hank. I'll be answering your questions. Thank you for standing shoulder to shoulder with me in the battle for life and truth. Thank you for listening to the Bible Answer Man broadcast with Hank Hanegraaff. Concerning those struggling with sexuality, you and I have an opportunity to demonstrate the love of Christ and share the life transforming power of biblical truth. Gay Girl, Good God by Jackie Hill Perry tells a powerful story of transformation and hope that multitudes today urgently need to hear. To receive your copy of Gay Girl, Good God, simply call 888-7000-CRI and make a gift to support the Christian Research Institute's life-changing outreaches, 888-7000-CRI, or visit us at equip.org. That's equip.org. You can also write CRI at Post Office Box 8500, Charlotte, North Carolina, 28271. The preceding program was pre-recorded. The Bible Answer Man broadcast is funded solely by listeners like you. We're on the air because truth matters and life matters more. The complete Bible Answer Book Collector's Edition revised and updated is a comprehensive collection of the most often asked as well as most difficult questions Hank Hanegraaff has received in nearly three decades of hosting the Bible Answer Man broadcast. This expanded edition contains new entries, leading readers to a better understanding of God and our relationship to Him in Jesus Christ. The complete Bible Answer Book Collector's Edition revised and updated is a comprehensive, handy and attractive volume that you will return to again and again. Take your exploration of God's Word to new heights and receive the revised and updated Complete Bible Answer Book as our thank you for your gift by calling 888-7000-CRI and make a gift to support the Christian Research Institute's life-changing outreaches, 888-7000-CRI or visit equip.org.